The reason I'm involved in self-esteem work is because I think it's the bottom line of every problem anyone ever has. When you feel you've got high self-esteem and you realize you can cope with anything, then what you do is you participate in life in a way that will produce miracles. You, too, will be able to produce miracles with the life-changing ideas you're about to hear in How to Build High Self-Esteem, a practical process for your personal growth. That's because when you feel good about yourself, you attract the people and events that empower you for more success than you ever dreamed possible. In this six-cassette program, you'll learn to develop winning habits that will pay off for you every day. You'll discover how to celebrate and capitalize on your strengths and how to accept your weaknesses without guilt or remorse. The main thing is to realize that underneath every aspect of our being, there's a function, a purpose, a valuable contribution that this part of me can make. What we need to do is we need to accept every aspect of ourselves because it's who we are. And someone once said, you may as well learn to love yourself because you're going to take yourself everywhere you go. You can't take a vacation from yourself. In a mix of live and studio recordings, Jack Canfield will help you feel more love and contentment than you ever have before, just as he's helped thousands of people create more positive relationships with themselves and others. Jack is an internationally known expert in the areas of self-esteem, peak performance, and the psychology of achievement. He's a graduate of Harvard University and the University of Massachusetts. He's a teacher, psychotherapist, and a corporate consultant. And he'll show you practical techniques that can bring about both immediate changes and long-term growth in your life. How can we become more capable? How can we become more successful? And these steps that I'm going to teach you apply to every area of your life. They can create business successes, personal successes, social, emotional, spiritual, humanitarian, global, political, doesn't matter, any area of your life. Prepare for your life to be changed as you proceed through a process that has changed the lives of thousands of people. As the Nightingale Conan Corporation brings you How to Build High Self-Esteem with Jack Canfield. In the fall of 1988, my wife Georgia and I were invited to Hong Kong to give a speech to an organization called YPO. It's the Young Presidents Organization. And there are literally presidents of companies all over the world, 500 of them that came to Hong Kong to get together and have a conference. And we presented on self-esteem and peak performance and also on couples relationships. And after the conference in Hong Kong, we decided we wanted to do a little sightseeing in the Far East. We'd never been over there. So we decided to go to Bangkok. And uh, when you go to Bangkok, one of the things you do is called the temple tour. And you get in a van with a driver and an interpreter, and you travel around, and you visit lots of Buddhist temples. And one of the temples we visited was called the Temple of the Golden Buddha. And when you walk in, there's this awesome sight. There's a ten and a half foot tall, solid gold Buddha. And it weighs about two and a half tons of solid gold. The gold content alone, without the artistic value, would be about $96 million, just in its gold value. And you walk in, and it's smiling at you. I mean, it's quite a sight. And as we were looking at it and taking pictures and so forth, I walked over to one wall, and there was this glass case. And in this glass case were these shards or pieces of clay about three to four inches thick. And there was a little story underneath. And it turned out that this golden Buddha was only discovered about 1957. What had happened was they were moving this Buddhist temple in order to make way for the advancement of technology and superhighways and so forth in Bangkok as it was expanding. And they were lifting up this clay Buddha to move it across town, and it cracked. You can imagine if you were the head monk of this monastery and you were moving this sacred icon and you broke it, okay? So he was severely distressed, and they decided to put the Buddha back down, and they put a tarp over it, a canvas, because it was starting to rain. That evening, the monk came out, and he wanted to see if it was dry. And so he put his flashlight up under the tarp and to see if the clay Buddha was okay, and he noticed where it had cracked a little gleam of light coming back, reflection from his flashlight. So he 
pursued this a little further and he looked a little more closely and what he discovered was that it seemed like there was something underneath the clay. And he took a screwdriver and a hammer, which is all that he had, and he started to chip away a little bit of the clay. And to make a long story short, several hours later, he was faced with this solid gold Buddha. Now you can imagine finding such a thing. Now what had happened, it turned out, was the Burmese army had invaded Thailand. And as they were coming down, the Thais knew this was happening. They covered this golden Buddha with clay because they didn't want anyone to steal it. The problem was, when the Burmese got there, they killed everybody. And so what happened is, no one knew that the clay was covering the golden Buddha. And 200 years later, the secret was still there, and he discovered it. Now, the reason I tell you this story is because I think that underneath each of us, there's like a golden Buddha, or a golden Christ, or a golden essence. And what today is about, this seminar is about, is how to rediscover that essence that lives underneath the surface of who we think we are. How to rediscover our self-esteem, our self-respect, our self-confidence, the essence of who we are. So what I'm going to be doing with you in this seminar is teaching you tools and principles that will allow you to begin to regain the essence of joy and power and love and competence that you had when you were a little kid. And somewhere along the line for most of us, when we were growing up, somewhere usually between the ages of two and nine years old, we began to shut down due to parenting, due to teachers, due to Boy Scout leaders, due to coaches and sometimes even ministers and churches and so forth and Sunday school. We begin to push down the essence of who we are we begin to have a sense that maybe we're not okay. And so what we're going to do today is learn a bunch of technology that will free us up and allow us to come back into a powerful relationship with ourself. Two out of three Americans have low self-esteem. Only 35% of us feel adequate and competent to handle life as it faces us. So I often say in a group like this, look to your right, look to your left, one of you is okay, two of you are in trouble. <laughs> And you can kind of decide who that is, see? But the reality is I'm telling you this because I want you to realize that self-esteem is not somebody else's problem. We all kind of think, well, I feel okay. Self-esteem must be a problem of the homeless or people that are drug addicts or something like that. But all of us are faced with this issue of loving ourselves more, being more competent, expressing ourselves more fully. In the state of California, we have literally a 25-person task force whose purpose it is to raise the self-esteem of the state of California. And we realize that this is a major problem because we're spending millions and billions of dollars for people to be in jail. We build more jails every year. It costs $30,000 a year to keep someone in jail now. It's cheaper to go to Harvard. See, so one of the things we realize is we're spending all this money on problems like drug abuse, alcohol abuse, spousal abuse, teenage pregnancies, and so forth. We began to discover that the root cause of all these problems was low self-esteem. So we have this task force, and we started to do research, and one of the pieces we discovered along the way was that in one school district, the kids entering school in the first grade, 80% of them scored high on a self-esteem inventory. By the fifth grade, only 20% of them were scoring high, and by the time they graduated high school, it was down to 5%, which says that the longer you stay in school in many districts in this country, your self-esteem actually goes down instead of going up. And so what we have to do, if you will, is take responsibility for our own self-esteem. Another study we ran across was one where they asked a thousand parents and a thousand teachers who was responsible for the development of self-esteem of children. Seventy-two percent of the parents said teachers were. Seventy-eight percent of the teachers said parents were. <laughs> so it appears that everyone thinks it's somebody else's job. So the essence is it ends up being your own job because no one else knows enough to take responsibility to develop your self-esteem. So one of the major tasks we have is to be responsible for our own self-esteem, our own self-confidence, our own self-respect, our own feel-good, if you will. Question always comes up, well, why is self-esteem so important in our life? And I like to answer it with a story that goes like this, or it's really a metaphor. And that is that there's this thing I call the poker chip theory of life. And what I realized when I started playing poker is that if I had a lot of money, I felt comfortable to bet a lot. And if I had a little, I played more cautiously. See, let's say that Jim here and I sit down in a poker parlor in Las Vegas, and Jim's got 100 chips, and I've got 10. 
Okay, he's got 100 and I've got 10. Who's likely to play more cautiously in this game, me with 10 chips or Jim with 100 chips? Yeah. I am. How come? Yeah, I've got less to lose, right? In other words, if I lose five bets of two, I'm out of the game. But Jim can lose two chips 50 times before he's out of the game. And self-esteem is like poker chips. Each of you that walked in here kind of like sit down and you put your poker chips on the table. And if you've got a lot of chips, you'll tend to participate in life. If you've only got a few chips, you'll tend to sit back. So what happens in life is we need to build up our stack of poker chips so that we can participate more. We've all heard that phrase, life is not a spectator sport. You've got to participate. In order to participate, I have to feel good about myself. So if you come in here today, or you listen to these tapes today, and you don't feel too good, maybe you've got 20 poker chips, but at the end of this seminar, you've got maybe 100 chips, see? Then you're willing to risk some of those chips. So if you stand up to give a speech at your office, if you contribute in a staff meeting, if you ask someone out for a date and they turn you down, if you make a sales call and you get rejected, if these kind of things happen to you, see, then you're okay because if you lose five or ten chips, you're still 30, 40, 50, 60 chips ahead of where you were when you started. So our purpose in this work is to build up that inner stack of poker chips so that not only can we feel good, but that we can actually produce greater results in our life because of the willingness to risk and participate more fully in life. In order to learn more in life, you also have to risk. I grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia, and I went to a little military school there from the fifth grade until I graduated high school called Lindsley Military Institute. The initials were LMI. The neighboring kids called it Little Marching Idiots. <laughs> and when I, was in the, when I was in the seventh grade, I was a member of the football team. I played football, and there was another guy in my class named Jerry Padoni who played football. And Jerry and I were really close friends. And one of the things that happened one day, we were in a math class, and we were asked to go to the chalkboard, and Jerry was asked to go up, and he was asked to write 1% as a decimal. Now, you have to remember that our football coach was also our math teacher, right? Now, here's Jerry and I. We love playing football. We want to be loved and liked and accepted by this football coach, right? He's like a big power symbol in our life, an authority figure. And Jerry goes up, and he writes 0.1%. Remember, the question was 1% is a decimal. He writes 0.1. And the coach gets up and he walks over to Jerry. Now, Jerry's about 5 foot 3 at the time, and the coach is about 6 foot 2. And he looks down at Jerry and he says, Son, that's wrong. You get one more try. Jerry started to shake as his hand went out and he wrote 0.001, which is also wrong. At which point, the coach takes Jerry and he starts to shake him like a milkshake. I mean, he was just really shaking this kid. And all of a sudden, I think Jerry said something under his breath, like stop it or something like that, which really plugged the coach in. And then he takes him and he throws Jerry out the door, literally right through the door. The door was open, but he threw him out through the door, and Jerry bounced off a locker. And then I think he said something else, like, you know, you can't do this to me or something. And the coach really lost it, and he goes on, he starts shaking Jerry, bouncing him off the lockers all the way down to the principal's office. Okay. Now, the question I would ask you, was it a risk to go to the chalkboard in that classroom? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is yes, okay? Now, most classrooms, most business situations, you know, most social situations are not that threatening. You're not going to get thrown out the door and bounced off lockers in life if you don't perform correctly. But in order to learn, he had to go to the chalkboard. In order to be successful, you have to take those risks. And so the idea here is that in order to build up our self-esteem, we have to risk in life. And we only risk as we feel good. And the more we risk, the better we feel, and it becomes an upward spiraling cycle of success. Someone said, risk ain't bad, it's the bumps. That's true. But I'll tell you something very interesting about that. How many of you have ever golfed or seen a golf ball? Can I see a show of hands? Most of us in the room at least seen a golf ball, okay? <laughs> Do you ever notice on the golf ball that there are little tiny indentations, little bumps in a sense? And it turns out that when they first started golf, golf balls were smooth on the surface. And what they noticed is the more you hit the golf ball, the more nicks it would get in it and so forth. The ball would actually fly truer and go further. And so then they started to design the golf ball by putting little lines through it, and then eventually you have these little holes, the little <laughs> dimples or pimples, I don't know what they call them. And so that, in fact, the more bumps you have, 
the more scars and bruises, you actually can go farther and faster in life. So don't think about all of those wounds and those hurts as problems. They're actually things that support you because you're able to handle that in the future. You're much stronger as a result of it. Let's look at the question, what is self-esteem? And I, I like to make it very simple. I have a little phrase called IALAC, I-A-L-A-C, which means I am lovable and capable. When I feel lovable and capable, I have high self-esteem. When I feel like I belong somewhere and people want me to be part of their group, they invite me to dinner, that kind of thing, I feel lovable. When I feel competent, that I can handle anything in life, that whatever shows up, I'm able to deal with it, that I'm adequate to the task of life, then I feel capable. And when I have these two things going, lovable and capable, I have high self-esteem. The love side is really unconditionally accepting yourself just the way you are. To feel that no matter what problems you have, no matter what your body shape is, that you are absolutely 100% lovable. Now where do we get that experience that we're lovable? It's from having someone in our life sometime love us. So if we're children growing up, the two things we need to feel lovable and capable are nurturing and love and structure. Now if you didn't get that as a kid, then you've got to give it to yourself now. We have to reparent ourselves. The most important relationship in our lives is our relationship with our parents. And a lot of us got what we needed from our parents, which was structure and nurturing and guidance and encouragement and support. And a lot of us didn't. A lot of us were told things like, who do you think you are? And you're never going to amount to anything and stuff like that. So we need to take responsibility for giving ourselves the kind of nurturing support that we may not have gotten from our parents, the kind of positive encouragement to go for our dreams that we didn't get from our parents. Sometimes even the nurturing and the touching we didn't get from our parents, we need to build into our life through getting massages and making sure we get enough hugs and cuddling and nurturing in life. And when we get those experiences, it starts to heal and fill that lack that we had from childhood so that we can become a full, whole person as an adult. One of the aspects of parenting ourselves is providing ourselves with the kind of words that we never heard as a kid. And we usually call that self-talk. And the self-talk needs to be positive. So I need to say the kind of things like, you can do it. I know you can go for your goal and achieve it. I really love you. You're a great person. You can have anything you want. Things like that, so that we start giving ourselves the kind of parental messages of permission and encouragement and support that we didn't get as a kid. We have to put ourselves in places where we can get the love and the parenting and the nurturing that we need and also learn the structure to make life work. Having the structure of managing our time, how to set goals, how to be effective and competent, how the universe works. See, if I take this little clock here and I drop it, there's this law, this structure called gravity, right? Every time I drop it, it'll always fall. I can count on that, all right? I've never held it out there and let go of it and had it float in space. And the same thing is true in the universe. There are universal laws that if you utilize them, you can count on certain things happening, just the way I can count on this clock falling to the ground. But if you don't know those laws, if you don't know those structures, both in terms of how to feel good and how to produce success in life, then you're at a disadvantage. So we need that capability, mastery, will, power, if you will, and on the other side, love, vulnerability, intimacy, and that kind of thing. Now the good news about self-esteem is that it's plastic, it can be changed, it can be malleable. So as you're listening to this, I want you to realize that wherever your self-esteem level is right now, by using these techniques that we're going to talk about, you can take your self-esteem and raise it to any level that you want. In the first half of this seminar, we're going to focus on how to feel more loving, more capable in terms of your psychological self. And then in the second half of the seminar, what we're going to focus on is how to produce more effective goals in your life, and how to become more of a master. I'm going to teach you what I call the 10 steps to success. So the first half will be about coming into a greater loving relationship with our mind, our body, our emotions. In the second part of this program, what we're going to do is to focus on these 10 steps to success. Also, in this program, there's a sixth cassette. And the sixth cassette is a new technology that's been developed where you're going to be listening to support statements 
that will take the principles of this seminar that we'll learn didactically and intellectually and charge them into the unconscious using three voices. It's a very powerful technique. We'll tell you more about it at the end of the fifth tape. Let me give you three suggestions for how to get the most value out of this program. The first one is to take notes, to write things down. Now, if you're listening to this in the car, obviously you can't do that. But if you're listening to this at home or at work, I want to advise you to take notes. Write things down. Capture it in pencil or pen. The second is what we call spaced repetition. I want you to listen to this tape at least six times. Minimum of six times. And more, if you can. Listen to this stuff over and over. Spaced repetition. Research shows that you'll forget 64% of everything you hear today within 24 hours. And you'll forget 98% within a week. So spaced repetition, review your notes, listen again, listen again, listen again, critical to success. Also, you have to put these techniques into action. I used to be a swimming coach. And one of the things I realized, we could give kids lectures on swimming, we could show them films on swimming, didn't make a bit of difference. We could bring in Olympic athletes, Greg Luganis, medals. But if they didn't get in the pool and practice swimming, they weren't going to improve. So you've got to get and put these ideas into action. It's a combination of information, motivation, inspiration, and perspiration. So today is going to be about motivation, inspiration, and information. And after the seminar, after listening to this, you've got to do the perspiration part, put it into action. Chinese have a proverb. Some of you have probably heard of it. It says, I hear, I forget. I see, I remember. I do, I understand. So again, Make it experiential for yourself. So one of the things we know, a great way to build self-esteem in your staff and in yourself and in your kids and so forth is to give people applause. Make them the center of attention. Let me say this at this point, too. Everything we're talking about here not only can be applied to your own self-esteem, but can be applied to raising the self-esteem of your children if you have kids, your spouse if you're married, your staff if you have people that work for you or with you and anyone else you come into contact with, clients, customers. Some of you work with Boy Scout troops and Girl Scout troops. Some of you are people that are involved with Little League and church groups and so forth. All these principles and techniques can be used to raise other people's self-esteem as well as your own. You know, it's so important to give mutually loving support like that, one, to ask for it in your own life and also to give it to others. There's a lot of research now about the importance of touch, the importance of human touch. One of the studies I just read was uh, from Princeton University where two people did research and they found that babies and kids that were touched a lot up till about 12 years old are much more able to be intimate and loving in a relationship. They find that they are able to snuggle and cuddle and hug and touch and hold hands. And people that didn't receive that as a child are very uncomfortable. They're not able to make that kind of connection with people. Virginia Satir, who was one of the um, key family therapists of our time, said that we need to get four hugs a day for survival, eight hugs a day for maintenance, and 12 hugs a day for growth. So you might think about, are you getting your 12 hugs a day? It's important to do that for yourself and to do that for your family and your kids. We need touching. It's a normal kind of thing. Kids do it all the time. They crawl into your lap, they touch you, they hold onto your hand. And then sometimes, you know, we start being told things like, you know, you're a big boy now, you shouldn't kiss your daddy goodnight anymore, and so forth. And we stop touching and cuddling and holding each other. It's a common need we have, and we need to start interrupting that conditioning and start getting and asking for what we need. Touching also affects us in another way. There was another research study I read where they put money in the change box in a public telephone. And what would happen is people would come over and they would make a call. And then you know how people always do? They put their hand in the little coin receiver at the bottom to see if there's any extra change. And they'd always find like a dollar thirty-five or something. And people would come up afterwards and they would say, did you find any money in the change box in the telephone booth? And they'd say no. They'd lie. Ninety-seven percent of the people said no. <laughs> then what they did, same experiment, they would leave the money in there. And then they would come up and they would say to the person, did you find any change in the change box? But this time, they would reach out and touch them on the shoulder or on the arm. This time, 95% of the people said, yes, I found money in there, and they offered it to the person that asked them. Somehow, touch makes us more honest, if you will. We also know 
that touching builds up the immune system. There's even a term now called libidinal refueling. When you hug somebody, you literally recharge the libido, the powerful energy in the body. And there's a whole new field now called psychoneuroimmunology, PNI. And when you feel good and you love yourself and you're being touched and you're in love, your immune system actually gets stronger. There's folk wisdom about people in love don't get colds. See? The idea here, again, is that touch puts us in what? In touch with somebody else. If you want to get in touch with yourself, start touching more in your life. And you'll feel better as a result of it, too. Let's look at another way of supporting ourselves and our self-esteem. I want to talk about the importance of joining a support group in your life. If you want to have self-esteem and you want to be successful, it's almost impossible to do it by yourself because self-esteem is created through relationship. Now, I'm not saying it's not possible to go off and meditate in a hill somewhere in a cave and have high self-esteem. It's probably possible for some people to do that, but not for most of us. Remember again, self-esteem is I am lovable and capable. And part of lovable is belonging. We need to belong somewhere. We need to belong to a church or a social group, a family system, a network, a club. Get yourself involved. If you're sitting home alone, it's hard to feel good about yourself. Let me tell you a story about a mother trying to wake up her son to get him to go to school in the morning. It's about 6.30 in the morning. She comes in and she starts shaking him on his shoulder, say, John, wake up, it's time to go to school. And John says, okay, mom. And mom walks out of the room, and about 15 minutes later, she comes back in, and John's sound asleep again. This time she goes over, she shakes him even more violently. John, wake up, son, it's time to go to school. Let's go, get up, boy. This time he pulls a pillow over his head, and he says, Mom, truth is, I don't want to go to school. She says, well, John, you got to get up. He says, Mom, I told you I don't want to go to school. She said, well, John, why don't you want to go to school? He said, Mom, there's about 100 teachers and counselors and administrators at that school. Not one of them likes me. Must be 2,000 kids in that school. I can't think of one of them who likes me. Give me one good reason I should get up and go to school. She says, John, I'll give you two good reasons. Number one, you're 43 years old. (laughs) Number two, you're the principal. (laughs) Now, I tell you that story not to make fun of school principals. They have a tough job out there. But to make another point, and that point is that people don't want to get up and go places where they don't feel they're liked, okay? So you've got to create places in your life that you feel when you go there, the world brightens up for you and for them. One of the groups that I belong to in California is called the Inside Edge. It's an organization that was started by Paul and Diana von Wellenitz, and they were cookbook writers. And what they really loved to do was create a space where people could come together over food and share. And what they decided on a trip to Russia when they were really getting in touch with their desire to contribute to world peace was they were going to create a place where people could come together and bring great speakers and facilitators together and share. And they have four chapters now in California. And I belong to the one in Beverly Hills. And I get up every Tuesday morning around 5 o'clock and I get there by 6.30. It's when we start, 6.30 in the morning. And you got to believe, for me, who's a night person, it's got to be a really good thing to get up that early. And we come together and we hug each other, and then we sit around and we, you know, we share our visions and our goals, and people support each other. And no matter what I tell people I want to do at the Inside Edge, they say, go for it. No one ever says, you can't do that, you don't have enough money, it's already been done, forget it. It's a totally supportive group. You've got to find a group like that in your life. And if you can't find one, create one. Also, there are groups out there 12-step programs, Adult Children of Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, things like that you can get involved in. Any issue that you have in your life, someone else is sharing that issue, and there are groups where you can belong to. You shouldn't have to sit home alone. Relationship is critical. I saw another research study recently that talked about our belonging needs. Two studies, actually. One was a nine-year study they did in Alameda County in California with 7,000 people. Another was a longer study they did in Tecumseh, Michigan with 2,700 people. And what they showed was that married people with friends have more than twice the life expectancy of single ones and they're overall healthier. They also showed that the single most important factor that affected longevity was social contact. For men, the more the social contact, the lower the death rate. And in the Tecumseh study, 
they indicated that men who did volunteer work at least once a week outlived men who did none two and a half times. Two and a half to one. Because they were getting out of themselves, making contact with people, making a difference, and feeling good about themselves. See, a lot of us sit home, watch TV, don't do that. We don't get that self-esteem boost. We don't get our belongings need met at the same level.